thank you all for, uh, for being here. And I'd like to introduce now uh, Irene Galenja Cooper, who is um, our lecturer. Uh, she is the mm. brain behind this trip. She actually uh, approached me a year ago. We met in, uh, not a year ago, in September. I was very fortunate last year in September. I went uh, to London for a month. And okay. um, Irene uh, connected with me. She had been kind of nibbling at me through Instagram and Goldsmith Fair. And um, anyway, she finally connected. We had lunch together. And by the end of the lunch, we had devised um, a trip which um, uh, Irene will give you the, uh, the inception of it. And um, she's going to tell us the story. Irene is in Cambridge. She is a PhD in Renaissance craft. Uh, she's the mother of three gorgeous girls. She has more energy and she packs more in her day than I ever thought was possible. And um, so it, it's been absolutely wonderful to work with her and create this, uh, this trip with her. So Irene, take it away. Hello everybody. Um, uh, is it okay for me to share my screen? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, let me let me give you the um, so then, uh, so then yeah, well, you can uh, you can there. do it now. Okay. Yeah, so there I'm you go. Yeah, actually in a minute, uh, simply to say that uh, I am super excited to be here like all of you. And uh, hopefully you'll you'll get as excited as Isabel was after a 10 minute sort of introduction of my nerdy passion for um, the Renaissance. And uh, I decided to show you my college in Cambridge. This is where we would have been. Um, we can't uh, go there anymore. So we've had to teach uh, without uh, stepping inside um, our colleges. This is Jesus College in Cambridge. And before we jump to Italy, we'll step uh, in Cambridge. Um, so um, we'll go to Italy via the UK later on uh, today. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can all see what I have prepared. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so, so all good, I suspect. If nothing. yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. So, um, so yes. So when um, um, I met. Um, with Isabel, I just wanted to tell the story of um, somebody I have met during my research. So I am uh, an historian of uh, Renaissance uh, Italy, but in particular of uh, objects. And uh, more specifically, really, if we want to go into sort of the nerdy stuff, objects that for most of the um, time have been disappeared. I um, um, I spend my research uh, and my life trying to um, uh, bring back to life things that have disappeared and through the, the objects bring back to life lives that have gone silent. And uh, sometimes even lives of people that were incredibly famous uh, during the Renaissance. But um, they were famous um, like, um, I guess, um, old sort of um, pre-social media, um, I don't know, cinema uh, VIPs were famous. So very distant, but uh, with the sort of impossibility of getting really close to them. And uh, one of my most recent encounters has been with a wonderful woman, um, uh, Margarita Bostra. And I got to know her through a list of objects. And I'm gonna tell you the story that I found one really, really hot afternoon while working in Naples in the Capodimonte Museum. And through studying her objects, I discovered more of who she was. And when I told the story to Isabel, um, Isabel came with the other side of it saying, well, but this is wonderful. Let's see whether we can um, put together the past and the present through uh, the stories told by objects and by the people who make the objects. So um, today I would like to uh, introduce you to Margarita Vostra. Uh, it's gonna be the uh, longest uh, introduction amongst the three days because I think um, it's, it would be great if uh, you could all become <laughs> 
a good friend of hers like I am. I am not crazy, but um, I, I do tend to get attached to this people I study. So um, today we are going to meet uh, Margarita and more specifically, I'm not sure you can um, see it all here, uh, the title, because I've got mine like this, um, through her life and her loves. So um, uh, I'm going to start with her life because um, Margarita, uh, to start, uh, you know, from a sort of a side note, she was very famous, but she was also a very um, sort of reserved woman. And it took me a while to gather um, uh, enough information to find paintings that really resembled uh, what she might have looked like. There are, um, uh, uh, there are three paintings that I uh, think are the best, uh, more reliable sources to think about her. One is this one that I am showing you, and it is um, a very young Margarita. And uh, in the next uh, couple of paintings that I'm going to show you, you'll see some details that will be recurrent. One is the fact that she always loved to wear uh, incredibly high um, starched collars. I'm not sure um, whether uh, it was uh, just her taste or because later in life she suffered from gout, uh, possibly also to kind of disguise some sort of aesthetically imperfected imperfection. Apologies sometimes for my English, by the way. I've been living in the UK for 18 years, but still sometimes the Italian <laughs> takes over. And um, a second uh, characteristic is that she always wore something on her hair. And um, most of the time, something that uh, is embellished with uh, precious and semi-precious stones. So um, the uh, second painting is uh, this one. You'll see again the same color and uh, a black overcoat that is lashed, uh, fashion of the time. And in this one, uh, more specifically, something even uh, more elaborate on her head. And I'm showing you details that uh, will help us later on to connect the past uh, with the present. In this case, her braided side uh, uh, hair is, um, uh, comes with a beautiful pearl. She was really passionate about pearls. Uh, silver clips on her hat and beautifully colored um, um, feathers. This uh, is the most stern and sort of uh, less friendly painting of Margarita. That's why, you know, I'm going to show it to you and then kind of switch back to the one I like. Um, but it's the third kind of, um, you know, sort of more certain that it was her. Again, this beautifully heavy brocaded uh, uh, black gown uh, slashed to reveal the, the underdress. Black uh, um, was the most expensive color uh, dye uh, within the Renaissance. So in contrast to kind of popular beliefs, anything black was not worn because of sort of an idea of mournful or austerity. It was actually a sign of uh, high luxury because it was so difficult to create. In this case, her dress is um, dotted with golden rosette buttons her head, yet again, is, um, I would say, decorated with precious, semi-precious stones, gold and pearls. Pearls that she wore in huge quantity, um, like um, uh, um, in, this, uh, in this painting. I love the fact that the transparent veil that she's wearing is also uh, sort of put together at the bottom by um, what looks like a golden pendant with a with a precious stone and a baroque pearl. So a lucky lady, uh, she could wear beautiful things, and um, but she was not always um, a lucky lady. So um, Margarita of Austria is one of the very very few women during the Renaissance who was born from an illicit relationship between an emperor and a tapestry maker from the Netherlands, but whose life was not left uh, in silence and forgotten and abandoned, but whose life was turned upside down because of the sort of political mind of her father, Charles V. This is um, 
romantic representation of baby Margherita in a crib with uh, the poor tapestry maker and her father, the emperor Charles V. He decided when she was born that he could have used her to expand his empire. He could have used her as a political pawn and marry her to somebody pretty um, famous and powerful. And so this is what he did. Um, here is uh, her father, and this is her first uh, husband. Charles V decided that um, what he wanted to do was to um, own the whole of the Italian peninsula. Unfortunately, he only reached uh, up to Naples and then the rest was, and Milan, and then the rest was instead owned by the Medici in Florence and the church in Rome. So he thought, why not? I'm gonna marry Margherita to one of the dukes uh, of Florence, Alessandro. When she was eight years old, she was taken from her mother, uh, brought to Florence, uh, betrothed to uh, Alessandro de' Medici, which, uh, who we are seeing here. And then um, too young, thank goodness, they realized that to be married, she was uh, given into the care or, of a very famous Italian princess called the Princess of Sulimena. And she lived with the princess in Naples uh, for about uh, six years until she was 14 and brought back to Florence where she wedded Alessandro. She was incredibly in love with him. And uh, I'm gonna uh, tell you why I think this later on. Um, she uh, imagined her life as, uh, you know, in her Florentine palazzo, um, amongst the most beautiful uh, things that Italy can offer. Unfortunately, her marriage with him lasted only for a month because we are in the Renaissance and you have to be careful. Alessandro wasn't, so his cousin killed him during the night, Lorenzaccio. The, um, so after a month, Margherita was uh, uh, robbed of her dreams, uh, removed from Florence actually, straight away on the night of the assassination. And uh, her father did not um, lose any time. He decided to uh, take her and reallocate her, really like a, like a sort of object, onto another man. This time, Ottavio Farnese, her second husband. He was the duke of all the northern um, part of Italy, Parma e Piacenza, and the illicit son of Pope Pius III. So Margherita, uh, from uh, the love that she felt uh, for Alessandro, was um, instead um, forced into a marriage with a man that she didn't really like. And um, she didn't really like the association with the church and with the Pope, who did something uh, pretty um, harsh to her. Um, uh, the idea is that you marry somebody so then you can give him a son. And in this way, you know, the power carries on. This was not happening. They sent the doctors to examine Margherita. The results were read by the Pope in Rome in front of a square for people. So um, uh, I don't know. It feels like uh, the recent news about um, crazy royals um, where, you know, old stories, old news really, uh, mistreated ladies within royalties. And, uh, but at the end, she did give him a son, uh, another man, uh, this, uh, who she, whom she called Alessandro for, um, I think, uh, remembrance of the man that she loved. So here she is, um, sternly beautiful. And I just wanted to show you very briefly, and do raise your hands if I'm getting a little bit too nerdy, too fast. Just, you know, jump in and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll change uh, tone or, or news to deliver to you. So it's, perf I'm, it's perfect, I mean, just okay, carry on. So what I wanted to show you is um, a map of um, what Charles V had at the time that Margherita was born. Is everything that you see in red, plus the uh, stripy um, additions. So as you can see, he had everything, Spain, Portugal, 
south of Italy, Milan, bits of France, and uh, what it was called, uh, what it was known as the Low Countries. Um, and you can see that he wanted to spill the red blood all the way through the gray bits of the Italian peninsula. So that's what he was trying to do with marrying Margherita to this powerful man. But uh, she was cleverer than him. And what he did was, uh, what she did was to ask him to become the governor of uh, the low countries up there where the pink arrow is. Uh, she said to her father, I come from there. I, um, I will uh, surely learn the language again. Uh, take me there and I will uh, be your ruler for those countries. So um, it was, I think, a way to escape a really unhappy marriage. And she left the northern Italy where, and where Ottavio was. And she moved uh, into the low countries where she stayed for 20 years of her life. She never went back. She never went back to her son and she never went back to her husband. Um, and this is a romanticized uh, painting of Margherita entering um, Amsterdam the day of um, the day she became the ruler uh, of the low countries. She uh, loved it there, but it was also a time of uh, war. Uh, the Low Countries were divided by a, a horrible religious war between Catholics and Protestants. And we have all her letters that she wrote to her father and then to her brother when he died, begging him to intervene into something that was becoming um, uh, sad, sadder and sadder day after day. Nobody did anything, of course. And so she started uh, traveling um, uh, throughout Europe to ask for alliances to stop uh, uh, such a war. And I'm saying all of this and I'm giving you all these hints uh, um, of um, her life because I think these are all things that will come back to us when we encounter uh, one of the craft uh, people uh, later on. Um, it's it's when, when a life is made of, um, you know, uh, journeys, is made of uh, wars, is made of, uh, that abandonment of a homeland for another. And, um, and uh, Margherita's life was uh, full of this. When, uh, after 20 years of her life, sorry, I keep moving this because I don't know. Um, after 20 years uh, spent in the Netherlands in uh, 1584, she felt incredibly ill. There are all these letters um, uh, between her and her physician. She had um, really strong abdominal pains. Probably nowadays we would think of uh, sort of cancer. There was no uh, cure for her. And um, they advised her to move close to the sea, close to uh, a warmer climate. And after having lived a life of luxury, of courts, of beautiful banquets and beautiful parties, of uh, ruling, of being surrounded by so many men who wanted to um, use her to increase their own power. At the end of her life, uh, two years before dying, she abandons everything and she decides to move right there where you see that, that re red arrow. <laughs> So uh, she chooses amongst all the possessions of the Spanish empire in Europe and in South America to move in a small seaside town called Ortona. And as you can see, is um, one of the, uh, why being in the mainland is still one of the farthest points from uh, the triangle of power Venice, Florence, and Naples. So away from everybody, she arrives on a, a late evening with a summer breeze via the sea. She gets to Venice and then from Venice, she takes a boat and gets uh, to Orsona that way. And she uh, enters the palazzo that you see uh, at the right hand side. That was the palazzo of a friend of hers. Uh, she uh, of course wanted to build her own palace, but um, things were getting a little bit um, slow and uh, 
she ended up uh, never seeing the end of uh, that construction. She only lived here in, in the Palazzo de Sanctis in Ortona. And this is when the story of Margherita and her objects really start. So Margherita, as I said, um, was connected with many families and many cities throughout Europe. She had palaces everywhere. Historians have studied her life through what was found in Palazzo Madama in Rome, in the Palazzo um, in Parma in north of Italy, in Florence, uh, the Palazzo that she left, and also in the Netherlands. She left them full of things that she had collected throughout her life. But when she decided to move to Ortona, she uh, wrote a list of things that she wanted with her. She probably knew that she had not much uh, left uh, to live and she wanted to leave it, surrounded by things that for her were her, her most treasured possessions. And when I discovered that list that is made of 118 pages of objects written and listed one after the other, I thought, um, what better way there is for me to understand really who she was by um, getting to know what uh, she considered the most beautiful things that she's ever owned. She was there by herself with some of her um, uh, staff, of course. She had um, her horses and she had her dog. Um, and I know this because she has a lot of things related to her dog, it was amazing. And, um, and a parrot um, with a gilt, a silver gilt cage with uh, paper mache flowers. I mean, she, you know, she was, she was all out there and uh, nothing was uh, made by chance in her house. And, um, and so today I thought that together we could enter her palazzo. So a little bit of a virtual trip within the virtual trip and um, imagine all these objects, sometimes scattered on a table, like on a day when she wanted to just look at all of them together. And some other times instead a little bit tidier with um, beautiful cabinets full of beautiful things. And, um, and uh, some, I'm trying to make sure you can all see this. And again, uh, some other times within uh, a beautiful cabinet uh, um, that could be uh, hidden behind wooden doors. The reason why I chose these paintings is not by chance and it's not because they are simply amazing to look at, but because uh, within the 118 pages of objects, uh, Margarita owned at least one thing that we are looking at now. So nothing that is there, well, um, with the exception of the monkey, the lobster, and um, a couple of other things, <laughs> but, um, but everything that we are looking at, she had. Even the craziest object that we are looking at, such as the skulls, for instance, um, um, that um, are scattered everywhere. And um, I love to think that, um, the objects listed uh, in her inventory, and sometimes they are, they are listed within boxes, uh, things like a walnut box um, studded with uh, sapphires contained three pearl uh, necklaces, uh, four diamond earrings. It was all written like this. And I remember seeing, um, I think it was an interview with Isabel where she uh, brought up all her boxes uh, where she kept Isabel's own, own treasure possessions. And it, even thinking about the boxes makes uh, me feel a bit closer to Margarita. And then we have the sort of flimsy box, uh, you know, the one with the wooden box that inside um, contains the haberdashery stuff and some ribbons. And then we've got the precious ones that possibly inside contain some jewelry. And then we've got, um, the beautiful pearls coming out of purses and then the sort of ribbons um, hanging within um, custom-made uh, cabinets. 
So let's together try and um, have a look uh, at some of uh, these objects. I would like to start with something that made me think about um, Margarita in terms of a woman who um, loved the man uh, who then uh, lost and was forced to spend the rest of her life with uh, someone she really didn't love. So within this painting, um, we can see a little miniature and some medals uh, hanging at the side. Margarita, um, uh, in her inventory on the day that she died, uh, she, she owned 63 images of um, Alessandro de' Medici, made in all sorts of shapes and forms. She had miniatures of him, she had coins, medals, and cameos. Of her actual husband, she had one medal. Um, so when I, when, I, when I read that, I thought, <laughs> So, you know, she was away from everybody and, in fin and finally she could display um, uh, what uh, she really had in her heart, away from the politicians of the time. But uh, let's get back to her objects and pretend that she's the little woman sitting on the velvet uh, green chair, looking at all her treasured possessions. Today, um, so that we are prepared for what is coming, I, wanted, I would like to uh, show you two categories of uh, things that she had. The first one is something that, um, well, both of them actually, both of them um, will make us um, go uh, onto our third virtual trip within the virtual trip. We're going around uh, the globe thanks to objects that Margarita owned. She only ever traveled uh, throughout Europe. She had no idea of what the world looked like outside it. And uh, she did own a globe, uh, it is listed. And I love the fact that uh, in this painting, we are looking at um, uh, the part of the globe where some of you are. And um, it kind of, I, I don't know, I felt um, it was a good sign to start by uh, looking at how in the 16th century people thought that uh, the world looked like. Um, so they knew that it was there, but when they had to draw it on a map, it became all something that um, was a bit of a creation rather than a reality. And here's the first object. We will see this later. We will talk a lot about vessels. Margarita owned 12 of these vessels. You can see four of them painted in the painting that I am giving you a detail with and um, uh, an actual um, vessel. It's called a Nautilus cup and uh, it comes uh, from uh, the animal, the Nautilus, that is still uh, in existence, although incredibly endangered and possibly um, caused its Sort of disappearance by the um, numerous fishing uh, that happened during the Renaissance. And um, they were one of the most expensive objects that you could uh, possibly have in your home. They were traded from the, uh, both the Indian and the Pacific Oceans uh, via uh, the sea and uh, possibly through trade routes uh, with Venice and uh, the low countries, the two kind of um, uh, big trading points in Europe at the time, they would come into Europe as uh, big shells, uh, plain and beautiful. This one in particular was taken to a goldsmith in uh, uh, north of Italy and um, commissioned with uh, the decoration that you can see. It is engraved and what uh, makes me think of um, is the, um, a sort of uh, an object that reminds us of, of all the senses. We can hold it and we can uh, speak in it. Um, it has got quite a, a big profound echo. It reminds us of the sea because of what it is, but the decoration takes us back to the land. Um, it uh, was filled uh, with uh, wine and it was used to drink from it. 
So I think uh, that having 12 of these objects uh, into her home, I wonder how much um, of this sort of sensorial experiences Margarita would have thought uh, when looking at them. The stem is a combination of um, another uh, shell that was then carved um, and a base made from a broken nautilus shell. But um, Margarita had uh, other exotic and beautiful vessels. This is a flask that has um, undergone an incredible journey to reach uh, the little town of Ortona. So the mother of pearl is made of, uh, was fished um, in Gu uh, Gujarat, uh, which is in India. And we know this because this particular example has been um, tested uh, uh, by the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. The mother of pearl uh, comes from India. It is shown at marketplaces throughout Europe where people like Margarita could have easily gone and chosen the beads that she liked and then commissioned the best goldsmiths around to create something that uh, she could in fact use. And so the silver gilt uh, design with the little leaves and uh, the finial uh, were possibly um, uh, commissioned personally uh, to look like they do. And it is incredible how this uh, example resembles almost identically, it's almost identical to the um, detail in the painting. Uh, Margarita uh, loved uh, being surrounded by things that uh, told her a story. She could have um, found books, a lot of printed books uh, were circulating in Europe about what was happening uh, in the other parts of the world. But um, she uh, was clearly someone who needed her soul to be enriched. Like now, uh, for us, our day, uh, you know, when we are closed off in our homes and we need uh, to think about uh, faraway lands where things are um, beautifully made and uh, traded to then end up in uh, houses. So I can imagine her uh, wanted to escape her uh, life by, um, by creating a collection they would have told a story. And on this, I just wanted to give you a note about collecting. The idea of collecting did not exist before the Renaissance. People always uh, acquired things because they needed them. They might have been beautiful, but they needed them. During the Renaissance, people started to collect things because they liked them. And um, sometimes they went uh, overboard and decided to concentrate only on one particular kind and they filled their rooms with nautilus shells and that's it. But uh, most of the cases, in most of the sort of cases, they, they try to reach for as many things as possible. And um, Margarita on top of nautilus shells and beautifully um, carved vessels, she also had a huge, huge passion for feathered headdresses. I found uh, it, it's about 120 boxes of unworked feathers of uh, birds such as uh, ostriches and things. So on the list, they're called the birds of paradise. I am not sure whether really she had birds of paradise's uh, feathers. But what I know is that during the Renaissance, um, birds of paradise like this one were um, images of them were circulating. For us now, you know, we can get it for granted that when we say birds of paradise, we can think about uh, these beautiful birds. We know where they come from. We know that um, um, if we could, we would be able to go and see them. But uh, from a little town in south of Italy in 1586, that was like for us thinking about going to Mars. The fact that she claims that she's had um, feathers from the birds of paradise makes me think that maybe she was just, I don't know, she wanted to brag a bit. 
uh, and in fact were possibly, um, I don't know, feathers of, um, uh, colored feathers uh, of um, uh, common uh, hens. But uh, what I know is that she had loads and loads and loads of them. And feathers um, were uh, one of the most uh, sought after luxury during the Renaissance. This uh, is one of the many designs uh, that are still, um, you know, uh, in, they are kept uh, in a museum in Florence of uh, uh, one of the most lavish headdresses I've ever seen made of feathers. The lightness of the material allowed for craftsmen to think big because of um, the sort of lightweight of the feathers. That said, I still think that something like this is almost impossible to, <laughs> to uh, sort of um, carry on our heads. But these were the sort of designs that uh, craftsmen arrived with um, in Palazzi, such as the ones of Margherita, asking which one she would have loved to have. The uh, working fed, creating headdresses with feathers was something that was uh, absolutely not a European craft. So, um, Whereas the Nautilus shell uh, was something that came from abroad and far away and then worked by people in Europe, feathers uh, were not only coming from, uh, from far away, but could not, to start with, being worked by uh, Europeans. Europeans did not know how to handle them. Uh, we have books and books that uh, tell about failed experiments in um, um, knotting them together, in gluing them together, in stitching them together. This is one of the Atsek headdresses that uh, from the mid 16th century to possibly the 1600s came in great quantities into Europe via the routes created by uh, the Spanish kingdom um, um, founded yet again by Charles V. So Europe suddenly is filled with things that uh, people had never even imagined existed. They tried to recreate them and they failed. So they decided to um, have uh, craft people coming with them back to Europe. And, uh, and uh, so local artisans started uh, writing notebooks by observing how these um, uh, workmen uh, used uh, their techniques to create uh, incredibly beautiful ob objects. This is called the Florentine Codex, and it's quite incredible that all the feather-related um, objects I found um, are were based uh, in Florence. Uh, Margherita would have easily uh, been able to see firsthand uh, these uh, men working uh, feathers. She could have also chosen feathers by herself. And I think it's quite interesting to see this because again, later on, we will um, go into the sort of nowadays version of a technique that substantially has not changed since the 16th century. What they needed to do, first of all, was to um, color them, dye them, and they would do that by cooking them into a big pot and then uh, dry them. Um, uh, as you can see, I don't know, I love the fact that uh, we are taken into sort of a proper workshop so we can see that it's outside, we can see that the mountains behind them. And if you ever been to Tuscany, you might be uh, familiar with uh, that kind of landscape. So you have a plain and um, uh, the sort of hills, uh, the green hills uh, behind them. We see them blue nowadays, but that's just because the uh, green pigment of the pages have fallen off. But that's another, that's another craft for another day. After they dried, uh, they were um, assembled um, into uh, all sorts of things, not just headdresses and um, clothing accessories, but also paintings. Um, in this little square, you see two paintings at the bottom as well as the one that the craftsman is uh, creating. And most of them had relig religious associations. And one of the most beautiful ones that is still um, intact 
is the one of the weeping virgin. And all the iridescence that you can see uh, is created by uh, knotting uh, uh, different colored feathers uh, onto the canvas. And Margarita owned three religious uh, paintings made of uh, feathers. I really. So, pardon? Where, sorry, where is this? Um, uh, where is this piece? This piece is still in uh, um, in Colombia. Okay. So this is uh, still in Colombia. It was made for the European market. Right. And uh, uh, these uh, sort of uh, subjects did not uh, say anything to the Colombians. They did not understand what it was, but uh, um, the colonization of the people uh, uh, meant that uh, subjects were, were changed according to the European taste. And Margarita had three of them. And I uh, find them uh, incredibly, uh, you know, still now to me um, are incredible um, objects. So um, I decided, so this is basically how uh, Margarita allowed me and Isabel to start thinking about uh, connections of objects uh, made in the past and treasured in the present, made in the present for us and treasured for the future. And so um, uh, I wanted to uh, create the link visually by showing you some vessels that she had and some feathers that she had. So then uh, together we can move um, to Cambridge and Florence and see more of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a perfect segue, the, uh, the next uh, uh, studio that we're going to visit. And we're looking here, oh, can you put that uh, image? Yeah, so we're looking here at uh, the vessels that were created by Tamar de Vries Winter, whom we're going to uh, meet a little bit later. But now we're going to start with the Feather Studio in Florence. Uh, and I know that uh, Duccio is online already, so maybe we can stop sharing the screen. Fabulous. I will bring you all back in on my screen. Um, there we are. I can see everybody. Um, before, uh, Duccio, I see that you are you're online. And before we go to you, I just wanted to know if there were questions for Irene. I mean, there was so much to take in there. I muted you. But please uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your questions directly to Irene before we move to Ducho and his fabulous Feather Studio. I thought it was fascinating to see, first to understand that collecting didn't exist and yeah. um, uh, the socioeconomic element of it would be wonderful to learn. Um, the aspect of colonialism and making object for your market that that mean nothing to you, but this is what the client wants. So, yeah. you know, this is what you give the client. <laughs> yeah. um, it's it's fascinating. Um, uh, Kathy Clark is uh, is asking, uh, am I wearing feather earrings? Yes, Kathy, I am wearing feather earrings. <laughs> I always try to wear, I don't know if you can see, I always try to wear, um, uh, a piece of jewelry that relates to um, the, the craft we're talking about. Uh, this is a, a French jewelry maker, uh, Prune, and uh, the feathers that are a peacock, um, uh, the small, the wild turkey, uh, the black jay, the golden pheasant, a pheasant lady Amherst, and Fezen Kulshid, I, I, so I apologize, I don't know how to translate that, but um, uh, she's, a, just, she's a young lady, yes. I just want to say that, you know, um, you know I understand that, uh, you know, if you felt suddenly overwhelmed by the story of this Renaissance woman, but do ask questions um, if you have any, or even, you know, even tomorrow, if, uh, if today is, um, you know, there's, uh, there's other things to think about, um, but um, oh, there is. Okay, so there's another question. Um, Irene, do you want to answer the uh, the question? And um... yes, of course. Uh, so um, I am trying to uh, locate them, but um, I have. Uh, 
the ones that I showed you today, none of them uh, I can tell for sure that were uh, Margaritas. What happened soon after her death, um, after the list was compiled, all the objects were um, uh, distributed back to Palazzo Madama in Rome, uh, to the Palazzo Farnese in, uh, in, in Piacenza, and the Medici started uh, a war of inheritance over some other objects. And I'm gonna show you the ones that I know that were hers um, over the next couple of days. Uh, ladies, feel free to unmute yourself. It's yes. just 14 of us. So for the question, unmute yourself. During the presentation, it's a little easier if, uh, if we are all muted, but please do feel free to just jump in. I have a question. What happened to Margarita's son? Yeah. Did, did she ever see him again? What, what really happened to him? Yeah. So uh, she did see him again. Uh, he was um, he was raised uh, by his father and his father's court uh, in Italy, and then um, grew up to become one of the most successful army general um, within the European uh, sort of um, history of war. Uh, Margarita called him several times up to the Low Countries where she was, and he went uh, to visit her, but uh, her diary entries are always of visitations um, that could have been um, done by any other political um, figure at the time. It was definitely not um, a sort of uh, mother-son relationship. Uh, so Alessandro, her son, was this... Uh, so she had twins, she had two boys and uh, one died uh, at birth and Alessandro was the only one who survived. And she uh, tried possibly to, to, to be the mother that she wanted to be, but because her life was entirely governed by the Pope uh, Pius III, um, I suspect that as much as they did a sort of public shaming of her inability of uh, uh, being pregnant, in, something similar might have happened in terms of, um, you know, this is what you were called for. And, and she, I think personally, she's been clever enough to, um, to distance herself from a place that would have created uh, her uh, agony and to propose herself as uh, the new ruler of the Low Countries. The first and only woman uh, in the whole of um, the sort of uh, Renaissance, when I say Renaissance, uh, I mean 16th century, so from the 1550s to the 1660s, the only woman that um, uh, proposed herself to, to rule. You know, in we can then talk about Elizabeth I another time. <laughs> she was the real deal, but she was born within um, the family of the royals. She she was who she was because of a birthright. Margarita proposed herself to become such a such a person, and that's why I find the collection of her objects so surprising uh, compared to. Um, the official line of work that uh, she was um, she was forced to live. It was as if she had two personalities, and her objects are disclosing something that, I mean, if you take uh, history books, what you'll see, you'll see daughter of Charles V, wife of Alessandro, wife of Ottavio, mother of Alessandro. That's it. But her passion for for everything else, for escaping through objects. Um, mm has always been hidden. Where did you find the list? Oh, that, that was amazing. Uh, so, um, so because my passion is for, as I said, it's a weird passion to, when I say it out loud, I always think that there's something wrong with me, but anyway, <laughs> so I, so I, um, I love to give voice and to give shape to objects that have long gone and people who have gone left, as I said. That was the, the sort of um, subject of my doctorate. And I decided to go um, and uh, see uh, what was left uh, from this list of uh, so many other people, not just Margherita, in the Kingdom of Naples. 
and I asked uh, all the museum, all the local museums to let me go into their warehouses. So I spent hours and hours going through broken objects because th those are the ones that are not beautiful enough to be uh, put in museums and they have the better stories. One day I was there and I think somebody must have seen me almost brought to tears by the fact that I couldn't find anything of any relevance. And um, it was one of the curators um, uh, at Capodimonte and she came with an envelope with uh, a, a typescript from uh, 19, uh, she said 1912, I think it might have been a little bit earlier. So beginning of the 20th century typescript. Um, I, she said, you know, I inherited this. I don't know what it is. I don't have time to see it, but maybe there are some more objects for you to, to study. Nobody had ever even opened the envelope. So it was given to me and those were 118 pages of typescript. And the first thing I saw, I remember, it was a list of um, uh, silver buttons. There was, uh, you know, it, it said something like uh, 112 silver button in a box. And I started thinking, ooh, what is this? And then I realized that it was a typescript of an inventory of um, Margarita Vostra. I tried to go back to the um, archive in Parma, where allegedly the originals are held. And I was uh, never granted access, which is, um, a common story for researchers in Italy and Italian archives. And so the list I am working with is uh, that typescript uh, from 1905-1912. And um, I have uh, published a few things about it already. And uh, I have a book that uh, is more of a sort of gap between reality and fiction about her. Uh, but the list is... Um, real and the arch archivists in Parma have confirmed that uh, the only inventory that was lost or thought to be lost uh, was the one in the Palazzo in Ortona because all the others um, are present. So that's how I got the list. <laughs>